Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're looking at the topic of evangelism, how we can be equipped to reach out to the lost, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and see them one to Christ. Now, reaching the lost is a very important part of our mission on this earth. But it's not just about what we say, it's about what we do. We must demonstrate our message, and sometimes only a demonstration of the message, an example of that message in our own lives, gives us the right to speak to other people. In my experience, it's so wonderful when somebody notices something in my life and says, you're different, what is that? And I can share with them that the difference is a person and a personal relationship with him, and his name is Jesus. I find that when Christians just talk the talk without walking the walk, then their evangelism is not effective. We're not honoring God that way. No, we should show people what we believe by our actions and let them see our faith by what we do. But that doesn't mean to say we should be shy about explaining our faith to people and proclaiming it so that they too can receive this same message that gave us life and gave us peace, the message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. We've been talking about the changes that come into a person's life when they've committed their life to Jesus Christ. Those changes are not automatic. When we receive new life, it's like being born again. We're like spiritual children, spiritual babes and infants. And that life is very evident. But the maturity only comes when that life begins to grow and develop, become stable and mature. So the process of encouraging new believers to follow Jesus Christ and to grow to maturity is called discipleship. And that's what we're focusing on in this program. Discipleship, being a true follower of Jesus Christ, establishing people in the faith so they know what they believe and are sure about what they believe and they know how to feed on God's Word just like a baby will drink the pure milk. So we should show people how they can feed on the milk of God's Word. And of course, God's Word is not just milk for babies. There is strong meat there as well. And we need to show people how to take the strong teaching of God's Word and grow in maturity and digest that teaching so that they can become more and more mature. I guess the best way of describing this is submitting to God. A person who has surrendered their life to Jesus Christ has surrendered their life to God the Father, which means in every aspect of our life we are in submission to Him. We're learning to be like Him, to grow to be like Him, to speak like Him, and to show Him to the world. Submission to God. But that's only the vertical relationship. When we are in submission to God, that automatically means that we will look at one another differently. We'll also be in submission to one another. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, by His Spirit, lives in every single believer. So when I submit to my fellow believers, I'm not doing it just as it were to them, I am submitting to Christ in them. The wonderful thing about the Christian family is that we all have the Holy Spirit and we are one in the Spirit. We can learn of Christ one from the other. We can demonstrate Jesus to one another. And that's what it means to be a true follower of Jesus as part of the Christian Church of Jesus Christ. True believers in submission to God and to one another in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also must teach them to be submitted to people. Jesus' submission to other people is perhaps one of the most unexpected features of his life. In demonstrating the kingdom of heaven, Jesus showed his disciples what it means to be a citizen on earth. So Jesus meekly submitted to his parents, his cousin John, the weekly synagogue worship, the Roman and the Jewish authorities in the payment of taxes, the high priests, Pilate, and he even submitted to the nails on the cross. Well, as a human, it was putting himself under human authorities. 
And in that way, Jesus gained the right to exercise authority himself. It follows that if we are making disciples and want them to, who want to live and minister with Jesus' authority, they must live and minister as Jesus lived, under the authority of others. And I stress that because, you see, today there is this rebellion against authority. People think that they're so smart to be whatever the authority says, they're against it, and they've got their own point of view. That's democracy run riot. I want to tell you, in the kingdom of God, there is not democracy, but submission to the will of God. And so people seem to think that they can uh, vote uh, amongst themselves on which part of the Bible they will follow or not. Or when it comes to obeying the laws of the land, they can say, well, it doesn't really matter, I'm free, I'm in the kingdom of God. As if the one meant that you had the right to disobey the other. Not at all. We are to submit to every authority that God has ordained and, and the secular rulers as well. And so we must teach them that in the church there is submission to leadership and to authority. In in the home there is submission to leadership and authority. We must teach wives in these days of rampant uh, feminism that submission to their husbands is a Bible principle. We should teach children in these days of rampant rebellion that they should be submissive and honoring and obedient to their parents. This is kingdom living, friends. Kingdom living. God has set authority. God has set order in the church. God has set order in the home. God has set order in marriage. God has set order in society. And so if we say we're in submission to the will of God, we're living under the order of God, then let's see it in the way in which people are in submission to one another. And one of the great marks of spirit-filled living, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, is being full of the Holy Spirit, singing, making melody, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. It is submission just as Jesus submitted. That's how we have to learn to teach our new disciple, disciples of Jesus Christ, whom we have reached with his love. A key element in this also is dependence. We must teach disciples that they have an interdependent relationship with other members of the body of Christ. Jesus depended on others. He depended upon others financially. He depended on a, on a, particularly on a group of women who were wealthy, who supported Jesus and his disciples out of their means. He was ministered to by wealthy women. He depended on, on others. He depended on others. He valued others for their friendship and companionship. And even in the hour of his cross, he depended upon Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross for him. And so this shows us a basic principle of Christian service. Disciples who want to give and minister to others must be willing to receive and minister in dependence upon other people. This is the body principle coming again. And so we show that uh, even the apostles must also remain disciples. They never stop learning, they never stop listening, they never stop receiving from other people. The moment a disciple becomes closed to input from other disciples, almost by definition it seems they cease to be a disciple. A disciple is a learner, somebody who is saying, I am ready to learn. That's what the word means, disciple, mathetes, learner. And so if we are all learners, there is only one teacher, that's our great rabbi, Jesus Christ. We're not to call people master, lord and teacher. There's only one teacher, only one lord, only one Jesus. And we're all in submission to him. And even mighty superlative apostles, they are also called to be in submission to the body of Christ and to be in submission to one another and to receive input from others and to be, to be discipled. Everyone must be discipled if they are going to disciple, disciple others. And increasingly across the world, believers are understanding that the purest and best way to be discipled, and that is to be part of a small group, whether it's a cell group, a home fellowship group, or something like that, a group where there's accountability under the leadership of the church to be accountable to one another and to be dependent upon one another. Not this hopeless dependence in which we hang upon each other and we depend upon each other like crutches rather than walking strong in the Lord, for each person must carry their own load but it means sharing with one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ. Must also teach the, these disciples to be truly anointed with the Spirit. 
and we will see that part and parcel of becoming a Christian involves both water baptism and spirit baptism, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so as these people uh, are taught to live a life of openness to the Holy Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit, depending upon the Holy Spirit for his anointing, so then they will be equipped with the authority of their kingdom to cast out demons and to heal sicknesses, to proclaim the gospel with divine effectiveness, and to live a life in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the life of Jesus himself. And so we see the link between the service of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So as Jesus yielded to the Spirit, he served as one who is the great servant of all, giving his life as a ransom for many. When John introduced Jesus, there are two symbols that he used, the lamb and the dove, the sacrificial lamb and the anointed one. The lamb implied that Jesus was anointed to be the greatest sufferer of all time. So this anointing that we're talking about, friends, is not an anointing of power, glory, triumphalism. It's an anointing to be under the constraints of the Holy Spirit. It's an anointing to be a servant of the Lord. It's an anointing to endure hardship and suffering and to demonstrate that we serve him perhaps sometimes even more powerfully at those times than any, any other time. So God wants us to be anointed to live a life of sacrificial service, to move forward into the perfection of Jesus Christ, not just to speak in tongues, to prophesy, and to cast out demons. The Holy Spirit is the parakletos, the one who is called alongside to help disciples get close to Jesus and to get close to others even if they are not ideally lovable people. He is the counselor so any anointing with him is bound to bring us closer to people in terms of counseling them and ministering to them and encouraging them. So we are calling people to live the spirit-filled life and to receive from God this characteristic hallmark of Christian living, spirit-filled living. Second Timothy 1 verse 7, Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So this bold wholeness about our lives and this soundness about our lives is just as much a mark of spirit-filled living as everything else. This means that we should learn to be bold in all circumstances. <laughs> the disciples before Pentecost forsook him and fled. But after Pentecost, they were prepared to die for him. No matter how much they were flogged or imprisoned, they never stopped proclaiming the good news about Jesus. And when the anointing of God hits your life, no matter how shy or timid or reserved you are, you know that you don't have a spirit of fear any longer. Not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of love and of boldness and power. We should seek the Spirit's power for this purpose and for every other purpose, every other God-given purpose for which the power is outpoured. The Greek word, as we know so often for power, is the word dunamis, from which we derive the English word dynamite, where we need a divine blast, not of destruction, but a blast of enabling, an enablement to defeat Satan, an enablement to dismiss Satan, an enablement to stand in the face of ridicule and persecution, to overcome fear and speak about Jesus and to do mighty signs and wonders at the same time as demonstrating, powerfully demonstrating that there's a new power in our lives to live the life that Jesus gave us to live. Wherever we're placed, we're to flourish where we're planted. This enabling power does not stem, my friend, from natural enthusiasm natural strength of character. It's not your bubbly personality that will get you through. It is the Holy Spirit who will give you this endurance. The all-powerful Spirit who will give you everything you need to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in all circumstances. Above all things, disciples should be dominated by the Spirit's love. By this will they know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. We need power to love one another. There's a little saying that goes, to live above 
with those we love. My, won't that be glory? But to live below with those we know is quite a different story. And we understand that too in our own personal experience. But the Holy Spirit gives us a love that transcends natural human love. It's the agape love of God, that selfless love that is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit according to Romans 5 and verse 5. And it's the kind of love that will drive these disciples on to preach about Jesus and to live for Jesus Christ no matter what the discouraging response or reaction is. The disciples should be characterized by the Spirit's self-control and discipline. This means that the Holy Spirit will teach us to deny ourselves in the service of God. And it's by these qualities of discipleship that these disciples are mobilized and released into winning others to Christ. And we know that this will mean sacrificial effort or sacrificial results in our lives. It will mean spiritual sacrifice. And we need today to know more than ever before, that God calls us in the gospel not to come and take Jesus and be happy, though happiness is found in him. It's not come and be blessed, though blessing is found in him. It's not come and be prosperous, though prosperity is found in him. Come and have experience inner peace and well-being, though these things are abundantly found in him as well. It is come and follow me and take up your cross. It's the cross-centered life. Luke 9.23 shows us that there can never be real Christian effectiveness without this level of sacrificial discipleship. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is a daily dying. Let me tell you about the cross that he calls disciples to carry. Some people say, yes, I've got a cross to, pe to, to bear. There's a pain in my life. And I carry it every day. It's some adverse circumstance. Some family member who is a pain in the neck. Some person at work who is a constant trial to me. Yes, I have to carry my cross. No, 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 no. That is not your cross. It might be the nails <laughs> that drive you to the cross. And it's time that we stopped asking God to take away those very circumstances which he has devised to bring us closer to the cross. Half the times you're binding God, not the devil. You think you're binding the devil, but you're actually binding God. Say, take that out of my life. I bind you in Jesus' name. And he says, it is Jesus. <laughs> it is Jesus is doing it. I used to think it was ever so spiritual to say, in difficult times, hallelujah anyway. It's not a hallelujah anyway. It's hallelujah because we can give God thanks for all our circumstances even the painful circumstances, because it's those painful circumstances that act like nails that remind us that we must take up our cross. Now what does it mean to take up the cross? It's death, that's what it means. It's death to self, that's what it means. And that's at the heart of discipleship. He says, you cannot be my disciple unless you take up your cross. You cannot follow me, you cannot learn from me. Unless you take up your cross, for the whole purpose of my life was lived in the light of the cross. I came to die, and if you're going to follow me, you must also die. Die to self. So it's not an adverse circumstance. The cross is not that. The cross is destruction of self. Take up the cross, deny yourself. That's what he says. It's the denial of self, not even self-denial. That's a big difference. Denial of self and self-denial are not the same thing. Some people can be full of self-denial, but full of self. They're just denying it <laughs> all the time. And some of the religious practices like fasting that people get into, all kinds of religious deeds and actions, and, and they, they think it's, it's all so spiritual. All these methods and rules and regulations about how you get close to God, they don't work at all. They have a show of holiness, but they have no power in checking the flesh. There's only one thing that will deal with the flesh, and that's the cross. 
And there's only one power that is strong enough to wield the cross in your life, and that's the Holy Spirit. And so it's by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh. And that means by the Spirit you take the cross and cut that cross into your life and you nail yourself to the cross. Hallelujah. By the grace and power of God. So these new subjects to the kingdom are not to be full of pride and self-will but they must be full of obedience and submission. And there's only one thing that makes that happen, that's the cross at work in your life. So take up your cross daily, Jesus says. Why? Because we, when, we get, when we go to bed at night, we, we, we want to get up in the morning and leave it there and just sort of leave the cross behind. So don't forget the cross. You've got to take the cross today. So before you are fully dressed, your shoes or whatever, don't forget, take up your cross. Take up your cross daily. And so as the subjects of the kingdom, we must obey the commands of the word of the king. We must obey the promptings of the spirit. And in doing these things, submitting, submitting to God, we will then experience the authority of the kingdom. And so, we must establish this in disciples' lives. As we serve self-sacrificially, then the authority of the kingdom and the anointing of the kingdom attaches to our lives. If we sacrifice our own proud self-reliance and learn to depend and to accept on the help of others and the Holy Spirit in particular, then we can live effectively. So that's why God tells the servants of God, us, to live and depend upon the promises of God so that we can serve according to the demanding standards of the Word. To submit to the leading of the Spirit so we can serve the hurting and the power of the Spirit. To submit to other believers so that we can serve one another in the body of Christ. To submit to society so that we can serve in society the people around us. Hallelujah. Wonderful examples that we see in the New Testament in this way. And so, we need to teach these principles in our evangelism. And it often depends on the way we preach the gospel. If we preach Christ crucified, if we preach repentance, if we preach forgiveness of sins, and if we preach commitment to Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, we have all the makings of a disciple. And when that person comes to Christ under those circumstances, with that message, then we will making disciples. So all new Christians need encouragement and teaching to grasp the full breadth and depth of discipleship. And we need to stress not just these elements but all of it. And the fruit of this is that we will see disciples take their place within the unity of the body of Christ. Not just reconciliation to a single individualistic relationship with God but to be part of the new person who is the body of Christ, the new man. Ephesians 2 verses 15 to 16 describes that Jesus' death unites Jews and Gentiles making one entity out of two and the great single purpose of the cross is to create this new single person through and for reconciliation. This means that every disciple has a personal relationship with God and is organically united with all the other members of the universal body of Christ. We touch on this in Glory in the Church. We see time and time again how that when we come to Christ, we come to the body of Christ. We are part of the beloved bride of God's Son. And so when we stand together, we stand as the body of Christ, as God's agent in the world. Disciples need to take their place within the body like that. Peter describes us as a royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, showing that we are to serve the king sacrificially through worship, seeking in our lives to bring him glory in all kinds of ways, through praise, worship, prayer, thanksgiving, as a corporate person together. And when we do this, we are demonstrating that we are a holy people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And as such, in that place as priests and kings to our, to our God, we are called to offer him ministry. 
to serve him together as his body. We are called to serve him as church leaders. We are called to serve him as members. So in summary we can say that the chief purpose of discipleship is to build disciples together in the church, to equip them to serve together in the world. And the proclamation of the good news of the gospel is to be announced in the context of full rounded discipleship so that God has disciples on the earth living for him, standing for him and serving him. Christian discipleship under these circumstances will be delightful. It will be genuine gospel obedience, genuine good news. And we will demonstrate good news and be good news to the world when we serve as the church like this. And that's when there really will be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. For nothing attracts people to God more. And nothing has evangelistic impact more than lives which are truly Christ-like. And so we see the importance of making disciples for Jesus Christ. It takes a disciple to make a disciple. And we need to have that commitment not just to win converts and to say, well, we had 30,000 decisions. But it means taking those decisions and making sure that every single one of them is not just an external decision, an individualistic decision, but it is a commitment to Christ and his body thereby reflecting the light and the glory of God into the world. That's what we're called to be and that's what we're called to do in our evangelism. God bless you as we come to the end of this session and we're going to come straight back after, into the next session to pick up from this point. God bless you. <laughs>